Although Josephine Sarah Sadie Marcus is best known as Wyatt Earp's loving companion of nearly 50 years, However, her life story, particularly her time in Tombstone, remains veiled in mystery. Throughout her life, she seemed to prefer it that way. Some modern historians believe that she may have fabricated details about her early years to conceal a dubious past. In her later years, she made considerable efforts to block the publication of books discussing her relationship with Wyatt Earp, particularly their time in Tombstone, Arizona. Despite this secrecy, some details about her life emerge from the shadows. Josephina Sara Marcus Earp's legacy deserves to endure, yet details about her early life remain somewhat elusive. While there are no existing records confirming her exact birth date, Josephine herself believed she was born on June 2, 1860, in New York City. Her parents, Henry Marcus and Sophia Lewis, were Jewish immigrants. Henry hailed from Prussia, specifically the province of Posen, and worked as a baker after immigrating to the New World. In the burgeoning Jewish community, there were distinct class distinctions between immigrants from Germany and those from Prussia. The German Jewish population often considered themselves more educated than their Prussian counterparts. Additionally, Prussian Jewish immigrants were more likely to speak Yiddish and work as craftsmen. However, they faced exclusion from some of the higher circles in Jewish society. In her later years, Josephine depicted her father as a German merchant, perhaps seeking to align herself with the more esteemed segment of the Jewish community. The Marcus family relocated from New York City to San Francisco during the 1860s, making an appearance on the federal census rolls in 1870. San Francisco was thriving due to the gold rush of 1849, boasting one of the world's largest Jewish populations at the time. Despite the family's moves, Josephine's father continued to work as a baker. They changed residences several times, as documented in San Francisco city directories. Both Josephine and her sister Henrietta attended school, although Josephine didn't seem to relish the experience. Instead, she was drawn to the allure of the stage and eagerly embraced music, and singing lessons. The popularity of the musical HMS Pinafore, created by Gilbert and Sullivan, swept the nation after its debut in 1878. With no international copyright protection, the production was in high demand, leading to multiple performances in various languages across the United States. Josephine and her daughter, under the guidance of her voice coach, ventured from San Francisco to join the theater troupe led by established actress Pauline Markham, to participate in HMS Pinafore. Historians speculate that Josephine might have adopted the stage name Maybell during this time, as there were no records of Josephine Marcus traveling with the Markham troupe. She later remarked that the excitement surrounding the theater was too irresistible for one to resist, remaining a child. Josephine was part of the troupe when it arrived in Tombstone in December 1879, marking a significant chapter in her life. Josephine Marcus was often depicted as a stunning and curvaceous woman, as recounted by those who knew her. With her brown eyes, glossy brown hair, and a figure that preceded her entrance into a room, she left a lasting impression on many. Bat Masterson, renowned for his exploits in the American Wild West, described Josephine as the epitome of beauty, labeling her as the belle of the honky-tonks and among the most attractive women of her time. During her initial visit to Tombstone, Josephine caught the eye of Johnny Behan, a man known for his short stature, quick smile, and sparkling black eyes. Despite warnings from some members of the troupe about Behan's marital status, their flirtation persisted. Following the dissolution of the theater troupe and Josephine's return to her family in San Francisco, Behan's letters began to arrive, expressing his desire for Josephine to join him in Tombstone and become his wife. Despite her family's apprehensions, they allowed Josephine to return to the mining town, seemingly growing accustomed to her unconventional lifestyle choices. Josephine found herself residing in Tombstone alongside Johnny Behan, and his son, Albert, from his previous marriage to a woman named Victoria. 
Their relationship unfolded amidst the backdrop of a tumultuous divorce, with Victoria levying accusations of continual drunkenness, abuse, and frequent visits to establishments of ill repute against Bihan. Despite the turmoil, Josephine chose to live with Behane, even though their union did not culminate in immediate marriage. Initially, Bian cited the need to amass more wealth before tying the knot, attributing his hesitance to financial concerns. However, as Bian's career progressed and financial stability became less of an obstacle, Josephine began to realize that his reluctance to marry stemmed from a deeper aversion to the institution of marriage itself. Meanwhile, another prominent figure, Wyatt Earp, was making his presence known in Tombstone alongside his common-law wife, Celia Matty Blaylock. Earp, described as tall, erect, and dignified, was engaged in various endeavors in the burgeoning town, including running a saloon and prospecting alongside his brothers Virgil and Morgan. Despite their differing paths, the lives of Josephine, Bayan, and Earp would soon intersect in ways that would shape their futures and the history of Tombstone. Virgil Earp's common-law wife, Alvira Ali Sullivan, played a significant role in the dynamics of Tombstone during that time. Meanwhile, Earp, known as Ailey, reminisced about their years in Tombstone as hard scrabble, reflecting on the challenges they faced. She described their life as primarily revolving around work and home, with societal norms dictating that respectable women remained within the confines of their households. For those without substantial financial means, life in Tombstone presented even greater difficulties. Josephine, despite her aspirations for a more conventional life, found herself navigating a complex situation. Though she referred to herself as Mrs. Behan, adopting the title associated with Johnny Behan, and even received mail under that name, it was a facade she maintained for appearances. Josephine understood the reality behind her self-proclaimed status, knowing well that it wasn't genuine. The intersection of Josephine's and Wyatt Earp's paths occurred amidst a backdrop of political ambition and personal turmoil. Wyatt Earp and Johnny Behan engaged in a fierce campaign to secure the position of the first sheriff of Cochise County in the Arizona Territory. Behan had promised to appoint Earp as his deputy if he won or acquiesced to his candidacy. However, when Behan emerged victorious, he failed to honor his commitment to Earp, sparking a lasting animosity between the two men. Amidst this political rivalry, Josephine found herself entangled in a tumultuous relationship with Bayan. She eventually severed ties with him after discovering him in bed with a friend's wife and witnessing symptoms of syphilis, indicative of his infidelity and questionable character. It remains uncertain precisely when Josephine and Earp's romantic involvement commenced, but it likely began around the summer of 1881. During this period, opportunities for single women were severely limited, leading Josephine to explore various avenues for survival and security. She may have turned to work as a theater performer, a prostitute, or both, navigating the challenging landscape of a town where men significantly outnumbered women. In such an environment, seeking the protection and stability offered by a man like Earp would have been a pragmatic choice for Josephine. As the infamous gunfight erupted at the O.K. Corral in October of 1881, Josephine found herself in the midst of chaos. Later, she recounted to her relatives how she witnessed the tumultuous events unfold and anxiously ensured that Wyatt Earp emerged from the confrontation unscathed. However, in the aftermath of the shootout, Josephine made the difficult decision to depart from Tombstone. Amidst the aftermath of the gunfight, Wyatt Earp embarked on what became known as his Vendetta Ride in pursuit of justice for the murder of his brother, Morgan Earp. This relentless pursuit took him on a quest for retribution, during which he sought to avenge his brother's death. Meanwhile, the shootout at the O.K. Corral and its aftermath sparked significant controversy and divided public opinion. In the years following the gunfight, opinions remained sharply divided regarding the justification for the violence that unfolded. Clara Brown, a resident of Tombstone, 
who contributed to a San Francisco newspaper, reflected this discord by highlighting the divergent perspectives on the matter. Some argued vehemently in favor of the actions taken by Wyatt Earp and his companions, asserting that they had no choice but to defend themselves in the face of imminent danger. Conversely, others contended that the violence was unnecessary and could have been avoided altogether. The events surrounding the O.K. Corral shootout elevated Wyatt Earp and his associates to legendary status, yet they also left a contentious legacy that continued to be debated for years to come. After Wyatt Earp's departure from Tombstone, he made his way to San Francisco, where Josephine had returned to live with her parents. It was there that Wyatt sought Josephine out and proposed that they share their lives together. However, this decision had unforeseen consequences for Maddie Blaylock, Wyatt's former common-law wife. Feeling abandoned by Wyatt's departure, Maddie struggled to cope with the situation. She returned to her former life as a prostitute, grappling with the pain of Wyatt's departure and the challenges of addiction. Tragically, Maddie's reliance on laudanum, a potent opium-based medication, led to her eventual overdose. Josephine, burdened by guilt over Maddie's fate and her role in the events that unfolded, sought to distance herself from the tumultuous period in Tombstone. Some historians have speculated that Josephine may have engaged in sex work during her time in Tombstone under the pseudonym Sadie Mansfield. They point to evidence such as Johnny Behan's preference for a prostitute known as Sadie Mansfield and Josephine's own acknowledged association with Behan. Wyatt Earp often affectionately referred to Josephine Marcus as Sadie, a playful nod to her middle name, Sarah. However, this nickname has sparked debates among historians. Some argue that Sadie Mansfield, a known figure in Tombstone's underworld, was a distinct individual from Josephine Marcus. They point to accounts from residents of Tombstone who claim to have known both Sadie Mansfield and Josephine Marcus as separate individuals. Following the tumultuous events in Tombstone, Josephine and Wyatt Earp embarked on a nomadic lifestyle, journeying from town to town across the American West in search of new opportunities. They established themselves in various states, including Utah, Colorado, Texas, Idaho, and Nevada, where they engaged in a variety of ventures, including opening saloons and participating in gambling activities. In 1887, they invested in more than two blocks of valuable real estate in San Diego, marking one of their most prosperous endeavors together. However, their success was short-lived as the real estate boom eventually came to an end, forcing them to sell their properties. Josephine had a particular affinity for betting on horse races, a passion she shared with Wyatt Earp. She often remarked that her love for horse racing, combined with Wyatt's penchant for gambling, created a dynamic that inevitably drew them into the world of horse racing. It seemed almost inevitable that at some point in their lives, they would become involved in the horse racing circuit. In her book, I Married Wyatt Earp, Josephine claimed that she and Wyatt tied the knot in 1892 aboard Lucky Baldwin's yacht, officiated by the ship's captain. Raymond Nez, their grandson, asserted that his grandparents witnessed this marriage off the coast of California. Despite these claims, there's no public record of their marriage. The couple remained childless throughout their marriage, as Josephine experienced two miscarriages and was unable to conceive. However, Josephine formed a close bond with Johnny Behan's son, Albert Price Behan, treating him as her own. The Earps were known for their frequent relocations, even when residing in the same city. From 1891 to 1896, they resided in various locations in San Francisco, including 145 Ellis Saint, 720 McAllister Saint, 514A 7th Ave, and 1004 Golden Gate Ave. Upon moving to Southern California around 1903, they continued to move residences several times. Their relationship was often turbulent, as recounted by those who knew them. Wyatt, known for his mischievous humor, would tease Josephine by calling her Sadie, a name she disliked. Josephine, in turn, frequently criticized Wyatt's lack of financial success and even his character, 
leading to arguments and Wyatt's retreats on long walks. Both Wyatt and Josephine were rumored to have engaged in extramarital affairs. Josephine, described as controlling, was known to interfere in Wyatt's interactions, particularly with writers like Stuart Lake, in an attempt to shape his image. She aimed to portray Wyatt as a virtuous figure, even influencing biographers like Flood, Lake, and Burns to depict him as a non-drinker, despite evidence suggesting otherwise. Wyatt's friend Charlie Welsh was known to disappear for days for drinking bingies, with Wyatt as his companion. Even when Josephine was away at religious conventions, Wyatt was known to indulge in poker games and drinking with cowboy actors, according to director John Ford. Despite their tumultuous relationship and the efforts to shape Wyatt's image, the truth about their marriage and personal lives remains shrouded in mystery. Wyatt Earp found himself thrust back into the spotlight when he was accused of fixing a heavyweight championship boxing match between Tom Sharkey and Bob Fitzsimmons in December 1896. The controversy surrounding the match reached a fever pitch when Wyatt, still wearing his gun under his coat, made a contentious call favoring Sharkey over Fitzsimmons. This decision incited anger among spectators and led to accusations of corruption against Wyatt. In response to the intensive scrutiny and negative press coverog, Josephine and Wyatt made the decision to escape the media frenzy by heeding to Noma, Alaska, where a gold rush was in full swing. They hoped to find refuge from the relentless scrutiny and start anew in the rugged wilderness of Alaska. Their journey to Alaska was further delayed when Wyatt suffered an accident, badly bruising his hip and rendering him unable to navigate the demanding trails of the Alaskan wilderness. Meanwhile, Josephine faced her own challenge as she recovered from a miscarriage. Reflecting on her experience, she expressed a sense of inadequacy, believing that she wasn't meant to bear children. Despite this, Josephine's maternal instincts remained strong, and she showered affection on the infants of her friends and family. She even maintained a special bond with Albert, Johnny Bean's son, from his first marriage throughout her life. Once both Wyatt and Josephine had fully recovered, they resumed their journey northward. Their first winter in Rampart, Alaska, brought them immense joy. Josephine fondly recalled the simple pleasures of baking bread, which she shared with Wyatt upon his return home one stormy night. As they savored the warmth of their humble abode, Wyatt's eyes sparkled with delight, and he remarked on the contentment they found in such ordinary moments. After their time in Rampart, Wyatt and Josephine journeyed to Nome, where they established a saloon named the Dexter. Despite the bustling business, Josephine harbored reservations about the establishment, particularly after rooms were constructed above the main floor for the use of prostitutes. She made efforts to persuade Wyatt to evict these women, but he remained steadfast in his refusal. Meanwhile, high-stakes poker games became a regular occurrence at the Dexter, with staggering sums of up to $500,000 in gold dust, wagered on a single hand. Throughout their stay in Nome, rumors swirled about Wyatt's alleged infidelities, adding strain to their relationship. Some historians even suggest that Josephine may have had her own romantic dalliances during this period. Eventually, they returned to the continental United States as they entered old age. However, adapting to a changing world proved challenging for the former lawman and his beloved companion. The rise of prohibition and the outlawing of gambling in various places made it increasingly difficult for them to find their footing in society. As Josephine grew older, her gambling habit persisted, exerting a considerable toll on their finances. A biographer of Wyatt Earp remarked on the changing times, where once established businesses were now viewed unfavorably and even outlawed. Despite the challenges, Josephine remained fiercely protective of Wyatt's legacy and her own reputation. Grace Welsh Spoladora, the daughter of Charlie Welsh, shared significant insights into the final years of Wyatt Earp's life. According to Grace, during this period Josephine received an allowance from her family, which she often squandered on gambling. 
leaving Wyatt without sufficient funds for necessities and sometimes hungry. As Wyatt's health deteriorated in late 1928, Grace observed that Josefini, lacking domestic skills, neglected housekeeping and cooking for him. Despite Wyatt's critical condition, Josephine failed to provid proper care, prompting Grace, her sisters, Alma, and her mother to step in and provide meals for Wyatt. Wyatt eventually passed away on January 13, 1929. Grace Welsh and her sister-in-law Alma served as the legal witnesses to Wyatt's cremation, as Josephine was apparently too grief-stricken to assist or attend the funeral. Grace expressed disappointment that Josephine did not attend the funeral, suggesting that she was not as devastated by Wyatt's death as one might expect. Following Wyatt's passing, Josephine instructed her friends and family to cease using the name Sadie, Wyatt's affectionate nickname for her, and insisted on being referred to as Josie instead. During their time in Los Angeles, Wyatt and Josephine forged friendships with several celebrities, including Cecil B. DeMille and Gary Cooper. In 1939, Josephine took legal action against 20th Century Fox, seeking $50,000 to prevent the production of the film titled Wyatt Earp Frontier Marshal. Eventually, the movie was released under the title Frontier Marshal, after Wyatt's name was removed from the title. Josephine received royalties from the film and half of the royalties earned from Stuart Lake's book about her husband. Following Wyatt's demise, Josephine spent her remaining years in Los Angeles. After Wyatt Earp's passing in 1929, Josephine Earp arranged for his body to be cremated and secretly interred in the Marcus family plot located in the Jewish hills of Eternity Memorial Park in Colma, California. Josephine herself passed away at the age of 83 on December 19, 1944, in the same bungalow that she and Wyatt had shared at 4004 W. 17th Street in the West Adams District of Los Angeles. Remarkably, she died with little to no wealth to her name. For her funeral and burial arrangements, Josephine received assistance from Seed Grauman of Grauman's Theater and William S. Hart, a cowboy actor who had been a long team a friend of Wyatt Earp. Despite not actively practicing her Jewish faith during her lifetime, her funeral service was conducted by a rabbi honoring her heritage. Following tradition, her body was cremated and laid to rest next to Wyatt's remains. Josephine had purchased a small white marble headstone, but it was unfortunately stolen shortly after her demise in 1944. Subsequently, Another flat granite stone was also pilfered. In a strange turn of events, grave robbers attempted to break into the Earps' grave on July 7, 1957, in an apparent bid to steal the urn containing Wyatt's ashes. Failing to locate the urn, they absconded with the 300-pound gravestone instead. Actor Hugh O'Brien, who portrayed Earp in the television series, the Life and Legend of Wyatt Earp from 1955 to 1961, offered a reward for the return of the stolen stone. Ultimately, it was found to be sold at a flea market. The cemetery authorities then reset the stone securely in concrete, but it was again stolen. In an effort to replace the stolen marker, actor Kevin Costner, who portrayed Earp in the 1994 film Wyatt Earp, offered to purchase a new and larger stone. However, the Marcus family viewed this offer as self-serving and declined. Instead, descendants of Josephine's half-sister Rebecca permitted a Southern California group to install the stone that stands at the gravesite today. The original stolen stone is now exhibited at the Colma Historical Museum. Since her passing, historians have engaged in spirited debates over the intricacies of Josephine Marcus Earp's life. Questions about her identity, her travels, her actions, and even her personality continue to spark scholarly inquiry. Yet, amidst the fascination with the infamous gunfight at the O.K. Corral, it's essential not to overlook the central figure of Josephine Marcus Earp. Her enduring love for both Wyatt Earp and Johnny Behan, leaders of opposing factions in the conflict, 
transforms the narrative from a mere tale of revenge into a poignant love story, one that deserves to be celebrated and remembered for generations to come.